Um, thank you, Teresita Fernandez and Ford Foundation for this invitation. At WCYC 90.5 FM, my mother DJ two radio programs, a Latina women's health show and a poetry series in Spanish. Located two blocks away from my childhood home on Chicago's west side in an area of mostly working class families, this DIY station was everything. House music on Fridays, local and national news in the morning, weekends with my mom. She read poetry in a very sexy voice. I was six years old, it drove me crazy. <laughs> but apart from radio, she was also a teacher's assistant at a local grade school, as well as a clown, a real clown, performing mostly at birthday gigs in our neighborhood for the families of her students. Her costumes were handmade, imagine red polka dots, a wig made of pantyhose and yarn. She claims that she was the first Latina clown to graduate from clown school. Indeed, she was the only one I knew who could bust out a balloon in the shape of a dog in 30 seconds. For my mother, her audience was and continues to be the folks on her block, uh, the people down the street, the ones that traveled from miles away across the border that crossed us, a complex community, not a monolithic one. Needless to say, my earliest art education is undeniably rooted in the experience of witnessing her creative work and its cross-disciplinary nature. It led me to pursue my career as an artist. I make installations, sculptures, sound pieces, performances, large-scale projects that deal with history, the politics of geography, and the body. My work also focuses on the psychology of architecture, our behaviors and perceptions in and around them. Currently, my practice takes place at a jail where I'm interested in identifying the potentials of art as a series of liberatory actions within my individual and collective practice. When I work with youth and families to examine local landscapes and create public performances, I think about counter narratives and the beautiful images we make together. As a professor, now tenure tracked, at a major art institution, <laughs> it was not an easy way in still isn't. I navigate my way in a dominantly white space, no different from my experiences of being a young college student. Artist Ernesto Pujol, the only Latino instructor I had in my four years of undergrad in NYC in, at Pratt, was critical in my development. I remember the power in seeing myself, a brown face, in another brown face, in a rather isolating place. With that, I ask myself now, what role can I play in academia? What does freedom and critical pedagogy look like here? You see, my mother's work was a social practice, a praxis, a mashup of making and teaching of action and reflection. I'm reminded of the work that calls upon all of us to think about the way meaning making is generated and how it is made visible or invisible. I think about the ways that local scholarship is generated by the people who shape communities from the ground up, who make in the sense of transforming the world. Roberto Bedoya recognizes that power and the radical imagination of community scholarship is what's valuable, important. What can be learned from this way of working and how can we invest in these creative communities that don't receive support from the field? Who gets to narrate? Who gets to frame? Let's recognize how the lack of opportunities for Latinos and POC people within the field of art is not only about a lack of imagination, but it's intrinsically linked to the issues that face us today, the defunding of public education, inequality, xenophobia, systemic oppression, who has access and who doesn't. In a book of poems by Fred Moten, he writes, we care about each other so militantly with such softness that we exhaust ourselves and then record in the resonance of our slightly open mouths the sound of that in the absence of the enemy that we keep making. I'm compelled by the possibilities, like the ways that art can create a softness in the hardness of things. I'm reminded of young people and organizers today, of their brilliance, of their vision. They are bold. How can art institutions be bold too? I look towards creative res resistance practices because the places I work in and the places I teach in and the places I come from are up against so much. It's a resistance to being silenced, a resistance to being erased, a resistance to dominant narratives. I think so much about what it means to be an artist and a human being in a time of growing state violence, the rise of immigration detention centers, how several generations of young Latino and black men have disappeared from my block with unjust policies. How does one generate power when feeling powerless? Here, a group of youth artists uh, and I reimagined a space that we know well because we live across from it. 
the Cook County Jail. It becomes a space for examination via text and time. Is there a way to play that? Neighborhood. I think it's getting people to think about it, like, uh, the jail's here, it's my backyard, but, like, doing this is, like, you know, it's starting to get your thoughts, like, yo, yeah, why do we have a jail, like, right here? And in this community, and, like, that makes so much money has something like this here, you know? And we don't have a museum. We use the pressure washer in the neighborhood usually to remove graffiti. And this is interesting because this is like reverse graffiti. So I really love this idea to use it to put a positive message just by cleaning. Seeing like, oh, today's your day, it might just change your thought on something that just happened or something like an argument you might have had with a loved one in there. When you look at the jail, you see people, but you don't see them as a person, person. You see them as someone that did something bad, someone that's just bad society and deserve to be the place they are. But sometimes things that people don't really do bad things to be in there. Why am I compelled to write? Asks writer Gloria Ansaldúa. Because the world I create in the writing compensates for the world, the real world, for what the real world does not give me, to preserve myself, to achieve self-autonomy, I write because I'm scared of writing, but I'm more scared of not writing. And so I wonder, how do we get to a radical shift? How do we get to a place where the fear is not arresting, but rather transforming? How do we go beyond tokenism and generalizations? There is specificity to our stories. We need to hear them. What do we need to call forth true systemic change? Not just in the field of art or the art world, but how do we critically lead the way in identifying the issues that affect us as living, breathing humans in this world and in this country. If artistic production and cultural criticism takes on the issues of the day, then what are we doing to create those platforms to making those issues heard? Thank you. <laughs>